Ready? There we go. Uh, I'm Paul, and I run the King's Co-op Bookstore downstairs, and I'm really happy to be finally hosting another book event here after so long. Uh, it's been about two years. I think the last one we did was Desmond Cole's book launch, and to follow up after that with such great authors here today is makes me feel really good. So first of all, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're hosting this event in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And I think it's particularly important to keep that in mind today as we discuss some of the themes in Omar's writing related to displacement and the concept of home. So before we begin, I'd like to first thank the Fry Festival for partnering with us to host this event here in Halifax. The Fry Festival is Atlantic Canada's largest literary happening, and it's been offering incredible bilingual events uh, with great authors all throughout New Brunswick since 1999. They hosted an event with Omar yesterday in Sussex, New Brunswick, and we worked together to add an event here before Omar returns home. The Maritimes is often left out of scheduled book tours, uh, and it's really wonderful that the Fry Festival is working hard to bring exceptional authors to the East Coast. Hopefully this can be the first of many partnerships, and I'd also like to thank the University of King's College for allowing us to use this room to host the event. As for us, we try to keep our events as accessible to everyone, so we're hosting this event for free, so there are no barriers to attendance. That being said, there are some costs associated with us doing this. So if you're able to support us by purchasing a book, uh, that would be great. And I'm sure our guests would be more than happy to sign books for you. And with that out of the way, I'm happy to announce our interviewer, Francesca Equiasi. So Francesca is a writer and multidisciplinary multi artist from Lagos, Nigeria. Her work explores themes of faith, family, queerness, consumption, loneliness, and belonging. Her debut novel, Butter Honey Pig Bread, was long listed for the 2020 Giller Prize, was a finalist for CBC's 2021 Canada Reads, the 2021 Lambda Literary Award, the 2021 Governor General's Award, and the 2021 Relit Award. Most recently, Butter Honey Pig Bread has been long listed for the 2022 Dublin Literary Award. Her writing has been published in Winter Tangerine Review, Brittle Paper, Transition Magazine, The Malahat Review, Visual Art News, Volume 1, Brooklyn, Guts Magazine, The Puritan, Canadian Arts, and elsewhere. And with that, I'll hand you over to Francesca. Thank you everyone for being here on a Sunday afternoon. It's such a delight to, to go out, I think. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Um, it's such an honor to get a chance to be in conversation today um, with Omar al -Akkad. I'm going to read his bio right now from the book, which you should buy. <laughs> Omar el Akkad is an author and journalist. His debut novel, American War, was an international bestseller and has been translated into 13 languages. It won the Pacific Northwest Bookseller Association Award, the Oregon Book Award for Fiction, and the Kobo Emerging Writer Prize. He lives in Portland, Oregon, and in case you didn't know, uh, What Strange Paradise, uh, his most recent book, won the Giller Prize, Giller 2022. So congratulations, thank you for being here. <laughs> I'm also so delighted to introduce, uh, to welcome Tarek Haddad here. Uh, Tarek is the founder and CEO of Peace by Chocolate. He's a Syrian-Canadian entrepreneur and a public, spe public keynote speaker. He is the recipient of Startup Canada's National Newcomer Entrepreneur Award, named one of the top 25 immigrants in the Maritimes, and selected by Google as the National Hero Case for 2018. Tarek won the EY Entrepreneur of the Year Atlantic Award in 2021. His business, Peace by Chocolate, um, won the Business of Diversity Champion Award. All this has happened since uh, Tarek's arrival on Canada's East Coast in December 2015 as a Syrian-Canadian newcomer. After losing the family chocolate-making business in Damascus in 2012, in 2012 um, yeah, it was, it was lost in a bombing. Um, a former medical student at Damascus University and a long-time peacekeeping advocate, Tarek joined medical relief efforts after arriving in Lebanon, and then he was welcomed to Canada on a community-based sponsorship. Tarek was recently one of the hosted panelists on this year's Canada Reads, where he passionately championed Omar's book, What Strange Paradise. Thank you, Tarek, for being here. Thank you. 
I'm so excited to talk to both of you. <laughs> I have to say, this is surreal, by the way. I was, uh, for many reasons. But first, you know, Omar's name has been coming to me probably almost for two months, since January oh, until March. Sick of me every, <laughs> every single day I was hearing Omar's name, or we can, we would we'd be meeting, or someone would call me for an interview, or be talking about calendar reads. So I have never met Omar, actually. This is my first time. We just got to, uh, to know each other over Zoom meetings. So uh, it's, uh, it's great to, to be here with you. Thank you so much for having us, Francesca. Thank you. Also, I have to say, I saw the trailer of Peace by Chocolate, which is coming out May, what is May it coming? 6th, actually. May 6th. It's a movie uh, based on your life. That's right. Um, so you should watch it. I'm excited to watch it. <laughs> You're still arguing who is more handsome, the guy who is acting me or myself. But I think we settled about who is taller for now, which is good. <laughs> like, we'll have to watch it to decide. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first, I am good to ask how you're doing, Omar. I'm good. Um, thank you so much for doing this, first of all. I, I really, really appreciate it. I, uh, today is the last day of Ramadan, so my blood sugar is at its lowest. I'm, I'm, I'm barely functioning, but, but nonetheless, barely functioning and happy to be here. <laughs> Tomorrow, we finally get to eat during the daytime, which is, which is a welcome change. I can't wait. Yeah, yeah right. I'm sorry that I was being so insensitive and just like gobbling my cookie. No, no, there, there's no good reason that you should have foreseen that. Like, no, the, uh, how are you? How are you doing? Oh, I'm really good. I, you know, I just took a cab from North Street because I live here, so it hasn't been that much of a trip for me. <laughs> um, but I'm doing really good and just um, excited to ask you about this book, about the Canada Reads experience. Um, and I guess we can start there. What was it like um, for both of you, um, for you to champion this book? Um, well, actually, for folks who haven't read it, um, Omar, do you mind? Actually, both of you, because now you know it so well, uh, talking about what this book is about without giving any spoilers. Sure, yeah. Um, uh, so, so What Strange Paradise is a, a repurposed fable. At least it is in my head, anyway. Um, it's a story of Peter Pan, sort of reinterpreted as a tale of contemporary child refugee. Um, it opens on a scene of a migrant shipwreck. There's a, a ship that has it's this rickety fishing vessel that has left Egypt, headed northward towards Europe, and uh, has gone down in a storm. And so the opening scene is the bodies washed up on the shore. Uh, there's this child, this nine-year-old boy named Amir, who wakes up in the first few pages, and he has no idea what, where he is, or you know. And from that moment, the book splits into alternating chapters, before and after chapters. The before chapters explain how he ended up there, and the after chapters explain everything that happens once he gets to the island. Um, and I won't spoil it. <laughs> because I'm a deeply insecure person, I Google the title of my book a lot to see what people are saying about it. And um, <laughs> if, you, if you start Googling What Strange Paradise, Google will auto-suggest, uh, did you mean What Strange Paradise ending explained? <laughs> <laughs> so someone out there is struggling with, with um, what this book is doing. Um, but I, anyway. suffered, I suffered with it too. Yeah, sure. yeah. I remember our long <laughs> conversations of me being like, shrug, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the first, yeah, I, th I thought, because it's a fairly short book, I thought, you know, it would, the, the, what I intended versus what people's interpretation, would, there would be a direct overlap. And then the first four people who read it had four entirely different interpretations of what was going on in the book. So. That's when I knew I was in for a bit of a ride. So thank you for taking it on, even though it has that, um, that bit of a roller coaster to it. No, thank you. I mean, uh, What Strange Paradise really has been uh, one of the books that I think changed my mindset on a lot of things, although I have gone through similar experiences. Uh, but I was lucky enough that my family did not have to take that risky trip on a boat. Um, many of my uh, neighbors, many of my friends actually took that dangerous trip. A lot of them made it to a safe haven in Europe. A lot of them did not. My cousin, uh, Helena, and her kids drowned in the Mediterranean in 2013 while they were trying to escape from uh, Turkey to Greece. So when I, uh, when I was actually just, when I started reading just the first few pages, I'm like, this is us. This is what happened to, to, to my people. This is what's happening to refugees every single day. And that's really what has drawn me to it. On the other side, this book really for me was kind of a huge piece of contrast. You know, it's not only the before and the after, it's about compassion and carelessness. Mm -hmm. It's about those people who care and those people who do not, those people who just move on you know, with their daily lives and uh, just believe that refugees are 
are like rats that you really need to, to just get rid of them no matter what. And there are on the other side of the, the, the puzzle, you know, very good people that they are trying to help no matter what, no matter how much the differences are, no matter, no matter the consequences for their, for their own safety and for their own peace. And at the end of the day, you know, the entire book, I think, fluctuates between, uh, between uh, those who do good and those who do bad. But for me personally, I just connected to it on a much deeper level uh, because for me, Canadians in Nova Scotia who welcomed our family are, are the vanas of the world, right? Mm -hmm. And whatever we have been surviving since 2013 uh, is just Kethros and, and all the people that they were really chasing down refugees as, uh, as if they were the real enemies. I think uh, it's, it's a mind-opening book on, on many uh, key issues and topics, but the first thing is, um, you know, let's, let's just talk about what we share as human beings instead really of what sets us apart. And I think the refugee topic is just, uh, it's I think a, a perfect time to bring up this, this issue in a way that humanizes refugees because we have seen refugees portrayed, you know, in many ways, in many movies, in, in, on the news all the time that they are, they are there to destroy the, the demographic side of the country, they are there to, to take jobs, they are there to affect an economy. Uh, negatively, but no one was born to immigrate. I think this is the fact that Amir was not born to immigrate. They were living a happy life in, in, in homes, and, and his family were, were happy there. And I think, um, yeah, the book just for me is about not really, it, it's, it's focusing on making sure the refugees are not the problem, and the world needs to focus on solving their problem. Um. And just to clarify, Vanna, for folks who haven't read the book, is another character in the film who is in the book. Sorry, one day maybe a film. I was seeing it actually. Um, is a is a, a teenage girl who is um, very compassionate. Um, and you know, just to continue on what you were saying, I, I found this book very affecting. Um, because I'm an immigrant and didn't have to, you know, I came through the quote unquote regular path of migration. Um, but, you know, I, I come from a country where the people are often trying to leave. I'm Nigerian and there's Nigerians everywhere and everyone has opinions about Nigerians and countries are like, mm, Nigerians. Um, but yeah, just like the multiple refugee crises um, that we have witnessed because we have internet, um, this just brought a lot of that to mind. And what you said about the dichotomy of like uh, hopeful and um, you know despairing or compassionate and cruel, and just thinking of things in extremes, um, I def I was really affected to think of my life here uh, in Canada in Nova Scotia, relative safety compared to like millions of people. It's it just extremely affecting. Um, I'm not going to get to more emotional, but can I ask why you chose this? Because I, I just was like, this hurts so much. <laughs> yeah, my, my books have that effect on people, as does my personality. So just, <laughs> just, just, just bums people out. Um, I, the, I mean, the, 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 it was, it was in 2012, I was, I was still working at the Globe and Mail. I used to be a journalist at the Globe and Mail for, for 10 years, and I was covering the aftermath of the Arab Spring. I was in Cairo. And um, I always go back to this as a sort of genesis moment in terms of like when I first started thinking about the things that congealed into his book. I was driving around with an old high school buddy of mine who was complaining about the rent, and he was saying, you know, the rent's too high, the rent's too high. And at one point I asked him, you know, what's, what's the, the price for an apartment in your building, for example? And he said, well, do you mean the local's price or do you mean the Syrian's price? And I was like, what the hell is the Syrian's price? What are you talking about? He said, well, we've had this influx of people coming in and they don't have a choice. You can charge them three times as much. I mean, what are they going to do, leave? Um, and just the casualness of that cruelty. And this isn't like the other side of the planet. If I was born a few years earlier, I would have also been Syrian. It was, it, it was one country at one point. This, these aren't distant places. And you have all of these Arab leaders across the region talking about our Syrian brothers and sisters. And, the, and on the street, it was kind of nonsense because there was a population that was fit to be exploited. And so people were going to find ways to exploit them. And that's when I first started thinking about the things that eventually became, became this book. Um, a lot of what I write about, I mean, American War, the first novel I wrote, and, and this one are very different books in a lot of ways. American War is much more of like a kitchen sink book. There's a lot going on. There's world building and so on and so on. 
but the one thing they, they have in common in a lot of my short stories and all the rest of it is this sense of feeling unanchored. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was born in Egypt, but I grew up in Qatar. I came to Canada at 16. Now I'm a dual citizen, so on and so forth. That sense of anchorlessness, I guess, runs through a lot of it. Um, and the other thing that runs through a lot of it is just luck. I, it's, it's, it's very hard to, for me anyway, to represent the power of blind luck in, 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 a, in, in fiction. In terms of the reason I sound the way I do is luck. Right? My, when I was four, my dad had to get the hell out of Egypt. The economic situation was bad, but also the political situation. And he got a job offer in Libya. And so we're in the airport, and we're waiting to get on a plane to Libya. My name is Omar Muhammad Laed. My, my, your, your middle name is your father's name. So my father's name is Muhammad Ahmed Laed. Ahmed is my grandma. Anyway, long story short, Muhammad Ahmed is a really common combination of names. <laughs> Um, and there was someone on the terrorism watch list with the same name. So we get taken into secondary, we miss the flight, the job offer is revoked. A little while later, he gets a job offer in Qatar, which ends up becoming, over the subsequent decades, um, the richest place on earth. So I end up growing here, instead growing up here, and I had no say in any of this. Yeah. And they send me to British schools as a result, and American schools, and now I sound like this, and so on and so forth. And it's, I, I'm constantly trying to get at that in my writing. How much of this is coin flips that we had no say in? Um, and what it means for you to sound the way you do, what it means for your life right now, for you to have gotten a British education instead of a Libyan education, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, who knows what, what that life would have looked like. And, and as a result, you sort of, you carry around multiple versions of yourself through the perception of other people. I mean, whenever I have conversations with people, right, like it's, you're like, what's the first thing they're going to latch on to? Because if it's my name, it's going to be one kind of treatment. If it's my religion, it's going to be one kind of treatment. If it's this accent, it's going to be an entirely different kind. And so you're constantly walking around preemptively correcting for whatever your reflection is in these other people's eyes. Um, and that's another thing that I, I write about because I don't know how to deal with it. Like I, I still haven't figured out a workable strategy for the many versions of the things I could be. Um, so those, those are the things that sort of end up influencing why the book is the way it is, as opposed to, to be perfectly honest, a much more hopeful or optimistic version of, of you know, that, that novel. And I know that was something that came up in Canada Reads, like That's right. hopefulness, hopelessness. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. I just want to go back to, to two points actually related to, to hope, um, kindness and luck. That's actually what, what just came, uh, came up. Uh, let me tell you a story about kindness. So I left Syria to, um, to Lebanon in 2013, in March, after our factory was bombed, after me and my brother were almost hit by a mortar rocket on a sidewalk in downtown Damascus. The next day, I went to my family and I said, this is not time to do medicine, this is not time to do business, this is the time to survive. We left everything behind. We had only uh, one car. We had three cars. Two of them were destroyed in the bombing for the house, and actually, after they set it on fire. So we had one little car that could barely fit five of us, and we were, my entire siblings were in the car with my parents, so we were nine in the car, sitting on the laps of each other. And my parents asked me to stay, sit in the back seat, and they covered me with my little siblings, because I was at the age to go to military, so they would not let me get out of the country. So I get out of, uh, we were on the way to the Lebanese borders, um, we just passed through, and then the guy, the soldiers would ask my dad, um, how old is your son? And I was not speaking. I'm like, I was literally acting as sleeping. And he was like, my son is 15. And he was like, OK, so um, in three years, make sure to come back to Syria because he has to fight for his country. And my dad said, OK, well, as, you know, but he just couldn't wait to get us out of, of, of Syria. We went to Lebanon, and we have, we have met a lot of people, actually. There are different range of, of people that you meet on a journey like this. Uh, I think journey to Canada was so different because we met the kind face first, right? Like we met the kind people who were like, welcome to Canada, all of that. In Lebanon, you meet both of them equally. You meet those who are against you entirely, and you meet those who are like, we understand your situation, and we are sorry that this happened to you. This could have happened to us, and we have lived through two That's civil the wars. Thing. It could happen to so anyone. easily to any people. <laughs> exactly, but the story of kindness was after two years of suffering in Lebanon, um, I was volunteering with the United Nations. I went down, and there was a cab there, um, and I, the cab driver, I told him, can you drive me to see my family? They are 25 minutes away from Beirut. 
and I told him I, have, I don't have any money. And he said, well, I'm driving there anyway. He was, a, he was such a kind Lebanese man. He was like, just hop on. I'm like, OK. We were talking in the car. You know cab drivers, they talk a lot. Like, they literally talk about everything. They should be like prime ministers and presidents, because they know literally everything. And he was such a lovely guy. After 10 minutes, he was like, listen, I really like you. Why don't you apply to go to Canada? And I'm like, really? Like, did you hear anything? He was like, yeah, there's a scholarship at the Canadian Embassy. If you apply to it, you might get a chance to go there. And you know, I totally forgot about it. After a week, I applied to come to Canada. And then I get that call. And then the scholarship didn't work out. But then they invited me with my family. And they were like, you're invited to go to Canada. And throughout this whole journey, you know, when I was thinking how my life would have been so miserable if I did not meet that man at that moment, so randomly, out of nowhere, I have no idea how this guy ended up there. I'm sure God sent it to him sent him to me. And, and uh, you know, he changed my life forever. And I started then reflecting on everything about small acts of kindness and what that really means. It could be life changing in the literal meaning of the word. You know? uh, and uh, back to the, to the concept of, uh, of luck. And the moment I landed in Canada, I just started thinking, you know, what is the difference between a Canadian and a refugee? Seriously, what's the difference? And the only difference was through luck. You know, that someone was born here or someone got the chance to get here, and refugees were just born at the wrong time in the wrong place, and they were living through their own circumstances. And you know, these judgments had to be, um, I, I think, uh, changing, you know, I think, to, towards those refugees coming from abroad and trying to just have safety and peace. So the experience on, on Canada Reads and the, the story of hope, actually, um, let me just uh, take a step back on Canada Reads um, was a, a surreal experience, an enlightening experience for me at the same time, because it was in a short period of time you have to dig into the five books, not only your book, you have to dig into the other books more than your own book, uh, because you know the, the style of the attacks, you never know what's going to come up. They don't tell you until the day before. You have a call at 3 p.m. with the director, and she was like, OK, tomorrow we're going to talk about hope. I'm like, no, please don't talk about hope. <laughs> please don't. I'm anyway, so I was, sorry, I was, I was <laughs> like, OK, let's talk about hope the next day. Okay. So on day two, we come to, um, to the show. And then I prepare my, my 60 second uh, uh, pitch to, to, to the show. And I was talking about how this book really teaches us hope in the depth of it. You know, Because so many books, you would find it so um, so clear and obvious, you know, you don't really have to look into the pages. And, uh, and it was not difficult for me, really, in many other books, like, you know, Washington Black, for example, or, or, or Scarborough in certain conversations. But what's Strange Paradise, you have really to dig deeper. And you have to understand the character of Vanna very well to know, really, that there is, there is that hope in the book. And I was trying to fight, I was trying to go into that fight, and uh, certainly there were many arguments that this book certainly uh, has no hope at all. Uh, I think a lot of the readers, so many, uh, so many times, have just missed the point that throughout the conversations, even on the boat, in the first place, why do people be on the boat? Why do people go on the boat? Because they have hope. Because they thought that by being on the boat, they're going to arrive in a place where they can restart their lives, where they can, they can get their kids in schools, where they can rebuild themselves, or get a job, or build a business, or whatever. This is why they got on the boat in the first place. And that kid just happened to be there, I know, by, by mistake, because he was following his uncle. But at the end of the day, really, the, this is the, 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 the true meaning of hope for me. It's like looking at the, at, at the future as if you really see it, but although you have no idea what's going to happen to you. And I think the, uh, the, the ultimate uh, change of events throughout the book has, has been uh, has been quite interesting, and I think it's a quite a page turner book. You know, I, I read *What's Strange Paradise* in uh, in one sitting. Uh, not only because it's a really short book, but I think the uh, the vivid scenes and the the, the description and uh, the writing skills that Omar has are quite phenomenal. This is something that I think everyone agreed on and reads for sure. Thank you, Tarek. I feel like your heart is pure, and like I just want to be like you because. <laughs> You're like hope and compassion, yes. And I agree. However, I also see where we're saying luck, where there's like privilege. And the thing is, like, where there's privilege, 
I mean, there's the inverse. For some people to be privileged, other people have to be completely dispossessed. And so <laughs> I love hope um, <laughs> and luck, and I believe in those two. But I'm wondering about like injustice, like, you know, refugees, people who end up having to live as refugees or in refugee camps. Um, it, it happened because of violence and corruption. And a lot of the time, I imagine, you know, like pe people got on that boat because we have in our minds, I, at least I did growing up, and in many ways still do this like, and this book talks about it, this like uh, idea of like a Western utop utopia. Right. But that's not by accident. Um, and not, not to be, uh, you know, swear word disturber, <laughs> but can we, I would love to hear about um, how this book touches on the fact that like, People don't become refugees um, simply because God said. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there is, there is the collision of, I mean, the, the book takes place at the, 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 the point of multiple collisions, right? There's a collision of those two fantasies, the one that says, if I can just make it to the West, everything will be okay, and then the one headed in the other direction that says all these people are barbarians at the gate and we need to stop them at any cost. Yeah. It takes place at that collision point. Um, and I think it takes place at the collision point between the systemic and the individual. I mean, particularly living in this part of the world, it's so hyper-individualistic. I think that's one of the reasons why empathy gets a bad rap in this part of the world, because there's a sense of, like, it's important for me to empathize. Also, if I empathize hard enough, I can fix the systemic issue through my, my individual, you know, manifestation of what I'm doing. Um, and I think a lot of these folks in this book are the individual casualties of a system. And they're never gonna be able to fix it individually, right? You know, you don't fix the systemic individually. Um, and in a sense, I mean, the, the, it's, it's very difficult for me to, to, to do what you have to do, which is present a case for the book. That's one of, you know, there's lots of obligations on the writer, obviously. One of the obligations that's not on the writer is to do just that, right? To, to sort of defend it. Like, by definition, these things are going to outlive us. And I won't be around to defend it all of the time. And so the, the plus side of that is that you can end on questions, and you can end on ambiguity, and you can end on this sense of this, this, this may not end the way that you want it. It doesn't end the way I want it. But that's the fundamental irrationality of being human. I mean, for me, literature, the whole point of literature is to give you a temporary break from the delusion that life makes sense, you know? And, and so a lot of my writing does that. It, it sort of ends on those places where it's, it's an uneven surface. Um, I don't for a second subscribe to the notion of, I don't think of systems like, like I write, I write pseudo dystopian stuff. Like American War is deeply dystopian. This is dystopian in nature, if not in world building or whatever. Yeah. But I don't think of dystopias as being stories about broken systems. I think of dystopias as being stories about systems that are functioning exactly as intended. And so, you know, when they talk about the Dublin Agreement in this book, or the notion that every refugee to Europe has to um, remain in the jurisdiction where they first land, where the vast majority of these folks don't want to be in the location they went. That's not a broken system. That's a system that's functioning exactly as intended. When they turn these boats around and drag them into the middle of the sea and leave them there, that's not a broken system. That's a system functioning exactly as intended. Um, so I think the, the, the point of view that I'm writing from tries very much not to conflate the individual and the systemic. But then these books go out into the world where that constantly conflates the individual and the systemic. And it, it causes for different kinds of readings, not all of them remotely close to what I intended. But I think that in, in having to defend the hopefulness of a book, I think you, you outdid yourself. Yeah, <laughs> I think you too. did it. <laughs> I tried, actually. What, yeah. was, what was your, you, you were on Ken, you, yeah. what was your experience? Uh, well, I was, a, I, at the end, it was between my book and um, Joshua Whitehead's um, um, so Johnny Appleseed. Johnny Appleseed. Johnny, yeah. Oh, so beautiful. And the books are so similar. So a, right. a lot of critiques about my book. I was just like, that's the same thing. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but it was it was delightful. Like it really, you know, it got my weird little story quite a bit more exposure than I 
could have imagined. And I got to, um, Roger Mukin, Mukin championed my book and I got to meet him and he's quite lovely, only through Zoom. Um, but it was, it's always a gift, I think, to uh, meet someone who, I, I really feel like he got my book and I, I wonder what, if, if you feel like you built a relationship uh, through, well, you writing this and you defending that book, like, I'm constantly amazed that you ever want to talk to me again. Like, I'm so assuming you cancel happened. my number immediately. I was sitting, I was sitting in, the, in the studio. We were live on radio and TV. And then every author was like trying to, uh, to tell the, 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 uh, uh, the panelists what they're going to gift them if their book wins. <laughs> Everyone was like, OK, I'm going to give him a tour of Scarborough. I'm going to give uh, you know, Mark. Um, Essie was like, okay, we're going to host you, we're going to go. And then uh, Michelle was to uh, Christian, she was like, well, I'm going to bring you here, we're going to go to restaurants, and we're going to tour, and then, and then it comes to me. And then here is Omar recording something for me, and he was like, Tarek, if What Strange Paradise wins Canada Reads this year, I'm going to give you the gift that you've been waiting for. I'm going to leave you alone. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to talk to you again. <laughs> and never talk to you again. So. <laughs> I think, uh, I think you all have really realized that uh, this guy has such a, a, a great uh, dark sense of humor, and I think it, it uh, shows really in, in, in his writing. But uh, I think we developed quite uh, the connection. We talked many times. We had uh, the, first, um, the first couple of times we talked were in January throughout the uh, there was media kind of syndication. There, was, there were interviews. Uh, and then there was a recording for you can watch it as well on YouTube, I think, on uh, CBC. Um, throughout this experience, I got to know Omar a little bit. I think it's different uh, because I read the book many times before our call. Like I read the book three times actually prior to our call. I'm like, we really have to get this to to survive on candidates. I know it's it's quite hard and it's not an easy it's not an easy task, you know, for me to defend a book that I did not write. You know, I think. Uh, Omar mentioned that probably authors would not be in that position because it's hard for them you know, to, to defend their books that's going to outlive them. But for me, I think What Strange Paradise has, uh, ha has impacted me in ways I've, I've, I've not imagined. Uh, and I think the, I had quite, I had 10 probably lists of books and I'm like, I'm going to go down with What Strange Paradise. So it was on the first selection. But at the end of the day, I really feel that we have built quite the uh, the bond, and uh, yeah, uh, he just won me as uh, really his best fan. You're kind, you're <laughs> entirely too kind, and you're going to regret that. <laughs> I loved, we were waiting at the back, and you came in, and I didn't realize you hadn't met in person, but you immediately were like, hi, so we should talk. I, I, I love to see your dynamic. You know, it, was, um, it was weird, the, the first, this is my second Canada Reads, my second rodeo. It was that thing, the famous saying about how everybody should go to two rodeos in your life. One so you could say this is my first rodeo, and one so you could say this isn't my first rodeo. Anyway, so this is this is my second rodeo, and the first rodeo was was American War, and uh, the champion of American War was Tamo Pinniket, who's this incredible actor. But in addition to being an incredible actor, he's also just a very good-looking man. And one of the things pre-pandemic that they would do is they would fly you into Toronto to the CBC building and do these photo shoots, like six hour photo shoots where you have to do these buddy shots, like you know the buddy cop, like that. And it's just the most demoralizing thing, right? They put you up with this guy and they're like, can you stand back to back? And I'm like, no, we can stand back to elbow, like he's much taller than me. And so the second time this happens, they're like, they tell you that you're gonna be on Canada Reads. they don't tell you who the champion is. And I was like, oh, this is great. What are the chances that they're gonna make me look bad again, right? And then I see this guy's picture and I'm like, thank God they're not sending us to do these photo shoots. Um, it's just not, it's not great for the ego. Um, all of that being said, I think I told you early on that like, however far, like if the book fails to, to win, it'll be because of the book. And if the, however far the book gets will be because of you. I mean, these things are, they're weird as hell, right? Like just the nature of them is, is very Art odd. Art is so subjective. Yeah, and, and, and who knows what's happening, right? It's, it's like the CBC is trying very hard to make it a positive thing. So now they're calling, uh, oh, they're calling you guys champions That's now champions, instead of defenders right. because they don't want that notion of defense and attack. But at the same time, like it's a survivor style show, right? And so it, it's fighting against itself a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to be in the center of all of that. That's right. And like you held it up so much better than I would have. Um, 
And it's, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the lasting thing from all of this is that we now know each other. And there's things that we've been able to talk about about the book that I think the preamble to explaining the background necessary to make that point on the show would have been far too long in the first place. But there's a shorthand there, at least, that between us. And yeah. that was an incredibly fulfilling thing, um, the process itself aside. So are you saying that you don't think you're handsome? No, I just didn't want to say that. I just, as soon as I walk into the room, all the cameras are going to, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I would have been the one in trouble. Yeah, Wait, I, I think you're very handsome. You're both very handsome. You're very kind. Thank you. Yeah, in the, in the Giller, generous of you. So for the Giller ceremony, they, they'd make you do makeup beforehand. So we walk into the, the makeup room. And the makeup artist, it was, the appointment was for me and Angelique at the same time. And Angelique is incredibly photogenic. And we walk in, and the makeup artist sees us, and she runs over to Angelique, and she's like, I have so many ideas for your hair, and we're going to do this. And, we're gonna, and she looks over at me, and she's like, and you're great just the way you are. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Turned around, walked out. <laughs> so thank you. That's very, that's very generous. I appreciate it. Um, I, I want to invite you to do a reading, but before that, I just want to point out, there's this beautiful book called Peace by Chocolate about Tarek's life and family and business. <laughs> um, if you haven't read it, it's delightful. It's written by John Tatry. Um, and Tarek, you said that he followed you around for a year. He actually, yeah. Uh, John and I, we kept talking for uh, quite a while, um, uh, probably a year and a half, uh, since 20, uh, late 2017 until 2019, and then he took uh, everything in the conversations turned into a book. Uh, he really struggled uh, with me because I talk a lot. So it was like I was telling him a lot of details that he did not need, or will ever need. <laughs> so I, uh, it's uh, you know he's he's my hero. He's certainly done a really phenomenal work. I would not have been uh, more happy, you know, more more honored to see a, a book telling our story in a way that enlightens and inspires, you know. I think in, in a world of darkness and anxiety and hatred, it's so hard to do this job. I think he did, uh, he did it in a way that, um, that brings hu the human perspective and the human aspect for our family first and put the people ar ar around us, you know, in, uh, and give them uh, an exposure, give them voice. Um, because unfortunately, all the time, I'm on stages, I'm traveling, I'm speaking, um, we are doing the movie release. Uh, my family are really busy with a lot of things, and my sister resettlement, she just arrived six weeks ago from Saudi Arabia, so they're all quite busy. And the people who helped us, they, they are not in the, in the spotlight. And uh, I was really upset for, it, uh, uh, for, for quite a while. So yeah, really grateful for John that he quite gathered all the perspectives and told the story in, uh, in a timeline that really makes it so relevant for Canada's future. And I always said, as an immigrant, you really want to document your journey for your kids and grandkids in the future to tell them why you left home. Like, this is a question they're always going to ask you. It's like, Dad, why did you leave home? What happened? And it, in a time when the media always focused so much on the world refugee as a label, it was hard for us to connect to uh, Canadians who were born in Canada did not have to go through the same experiences. In Canada, a struggle is waiting for five cars in front of you at the Tim Hortons drive through right? This is a struggle here. <laughs> or, or whatever happens in Canada, I think it, it still is a first world problem, right? But a lot of people really don't connect to the real uh, challenges. And at the same time, they don't know the beauty of our life before the war. They don't know where we come from. They think always about Syria is the war, the destruction, uh, the violence. They don't connect to the, to the kindness and compassion and generosity of the Syrian people who welcomed refugees as Canada did. Syria welcomed Iraqis, Palestinians, Armenians, Europeans during the Second World War. And you know the, these shared kind of values that speak very highly about where we come from, which you know we are never asked about about those issues. Because always you are not Syrian anymore once you arrive in Canada. Everyone asks you about the refugee experience. As you know, if you did not exist before that experience. And everyone forgets who you were before that. And that's really what, what has, uh, I think what John really did with, with the book. He tried to amplify the voice of the, uh, you know, the, the human connection within even my father and his friend Frank. My father doesn't speak English, so he always you know, goes and, 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 and try to make uh, the connection with others throughout the piece of chocolate that he gives away and see the smile on the face of the other person, right? So all of these kind of stories, Ria, that are being told in the book 
I, I really hope that it's going to continue being, uh, I think, uh, uh, inspirational for Canadians to never forget, never forget who we are in this country, never forget that really kindness begets kindness and hatred and anxiety always begets hatred and anxiety, right? This is the law of reciprocity that I call. But uh, I'm really always, forever, eternally grateful for John. Thank you. <laughs> um, Omar, will you please do a reading? Sure, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Um, so um, this book steals from a lot of places. Uh, it steals from primarily um, the two works quoted in the epigraph, uh, Peter Pan and a short story called uh, An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. Depending on how familiar you are with those two pieces of, of work, it, it's a, it reads as a very different book. Um, and it, but it also steals from the Odyssey and, and um, the Book of Nicodemus, which is part of the Apocrypha. No, nobody I know has ever read the Book of Nicodemus. There's no good reason to, but, but it, it played a big role in, structurally in this. Um, and the book sort of spoils itself on the first page and then spoils that spoiling a couple more times. So I'm not ruining anything here by reading from towards the end. <clears throat> I'm going to read you the final before chapter. It's a very short chapter. It's a page and a half. Um, the, the opening scene of the book, you know that the, the migrant ship has gone down. And um, every before chapter is leading up to that moment. So the final before chapter is just the moment when, when this rickety fishing vessel called the Calypso that these folks are traveling on when it finally goes under in a storm. <clears throat> so I think that's all you need to know. Um, these folks are on a boat called the Calypso. Uh, the central character is a nine-year-old boy named Amir, and this is the moment that, that the boat goes under. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the last moments, some held on dearly, leaving splinters of nail and streaks of blood between the boards. And although earlier the boat was filled with screaming, of these remaining few, none made a sound. Others, knowing now what was about to happen, what was inevitable, gave in. And without resistance were swept off the deck and into the water, and they too made no sound. In the distance, the island, the colored lights, the music. One final time, the waves lifted the calypso high. Under the force of a tumbling body, the mass snapped at its base. The sea overwhelmed, drowning the bloom of limbs that struggled to escape the lower quarters. Turning past the point of rebound, the old fishing boat flung its last few occupants still hanging on to the far starboard side into the air. For an instant, the deck became perpendicular to the surface of the water and then, like a closing eyelid, met it. Amir took flight, headlong into the seaborne sky, the roof of the great inverted world. In meeting him, the water was not cold or concussive, but warm and tranquil its temperature, the temperature of a body, the temperature of blood. With ease and without pain, he flew past the surface, past the depths, past the places where light and life surrendered and the domain of stillness began. And then lower, farther, past the crust of a million interlocking bodies who'd braved this passage before him and come to rest at the bottom, sick with the secrets of their own unallowed mourning past the smallest flower white bones, past the world at the feet of the world, to the lowest deep, then a lower deep still. Until finally to a dry womb of a place in which were kept safe and unchanging everyone he had ever known, and everyone each of those had ever known, outward forever to encompass the whole of the living and the lived. And each of these the boy met, in their old lives and their new lives waiting, and from each drew confession, and each he felt into as though there were no barrier between them, no silo of self to keep a soul waiting. What beautiful rebellion to feel into another, to feel anything at all. And then he surfaced. I could just cry. <laughs> The whole time I was reading it, I was like, oh God, no. <laughs> Will everyone be okay? No, everyone won't be okay. <clears throat> um, but, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for that reading. Um, I want to ask folks if they have any questions. Um, if you do, you're welcome to just project the question out. Questions for um, Omar and Tarek.
For recording purposes, I'm going to repeat your question. Um, and I want to make sure I'm, I'm doing it properly. And so you're wanting to know, you wanted to hear from them about the difference between the uh, portrayal of um, the refugee crises in Ukraine and previous ones, and how why we're getting a bit more detail and basically humanity, <laughs> humanizing. I'm sorry. Oh, um, I think I'll let Tarek start because his heart is pure. <laughs> <laughs> well, on this, actually, my heart is quite uh, not there. But um, I think the crisis in Ukraine has revealed a world where there are double standards in a way that previous refugee crises have, have not. Um, I was in many high-level meetings with uh, Canadian officials, American officials, just came back from, from D.C. And I, uh, I was talking to everyone, the speed of things, the speed of process about you know, how fast countries are reacting to, to welcoming refugees. Within a couple of days, there was a national campaign within the Canadian government to, to, to help uh, Ukrainian refugees, and the same with, with other Western countries. And, to, to take it a step back, a refugee is a refugee, regardless of their background, regardless, regardless of their ethnicity, of their skin color, of their culture, of their religion, of their faith. A uh, refugee is someone who, who, who lost everything. And, and as Omar mentioned in, in his book, I remember I read that war does not only happen to people, but also it happens alongside them. So Ukrainians are suffering the same way we suffered. The only difference is the response. The only difference is how quick the world is reacting and the world is supporting and the magnitude of the response as well within Canada and the other Western countries. I think it's, uh, it's quite uh, saddening, to be honest. It's, it's quite upsetting to, to see that if you are born with certain, uh, with certain culture, with certain background, within a certain country or certain geographic area, uh, that your chances to, to survive, even at the darkest of times, are much lower than someone else who might be born in a happy spot of the world, but just happens to, to suffer the same thing that you did. So I think uh, uh, humanity does not know any, any differences that, that this refugee crisis really is bringing. Uh, we as refugees, you know, when, when the war started in Ukraine, March 1st, me and my team, we spent 18 hours in the office building a campaign to help Ukrainian refugees and with the Canadian Red Cross. And so within March alone, we have fundraised $100,000 that went to the Canadian Red Cross within our, our organization, which is the Peace on Air Society. And uh, that did not happen because we have double standards. It's actually because we wanted to promote that before the Ukrainian uh, crisis, we also had a campaign called Welcome to Canada and to help refugee help with other refugees from Afghanistan, from Iraq, and from Syria, as well as, you know, we work with the Canadian Mental Health Association because peace of mind, you know, you have to have peace of mind and all of that. So well, for me, peace is inclusive. Peace is, should be accessible to, to everyone. And that's really my mission right now. In terms of, um, in terms of governmental responses, I, I truly hope that um, we, can, uh, we can just understand that uh, uh, anyone can be a refugee. Anyone, even in, in this room, can be a refugee tomorrow. And we have seen really how things just, uh, you know, it's, in a split moment, things can change. So um, I, uh, um, I really hope that throughout the, uh, the advocacy uh, from, from the people of Canada, I think governments can be, can be quite uh, uh, sub subjective, you know, can, can, be, can be responsive to, uh, in a way that is not strategic to a lot of those crises. But I really hope that we see that, I think Canadians have shown throughout, here's what, what matters to me the most is in 2015 and 2016, Canadians responded to the Syrian refugee crisis, although we had no connections. Like, we did not share the same culture. I did not speak English uh, before I came here. Uh, we, we do not share the same, you know, uh, backgrounds. And, and uh, you know, Canada is a first world country. Syria was considered a third world country. And, uh, but that did not matter to the people of Antigone that welcomed me with open arms, that they came to the airport who traveled two hours in the middle of the night to bring me from the airport, drive me back home, settle our family, give us opportunities, get our, our siblings in schools, support our business to start, and that's actually all portrayed in, in our movie. Just want, we wanted to share that uh, I think Canadians have an absolute great sense of understanding that this is wrong, what's happening. 
you know, that we should not be, that the response to our refugee crisis should not be based on uh, whether a country actually, and you hear it on the news, uh, somebody was calling it, uh, whether a war can happen in a civilized country or a non-civilized country, which I think it's, it's very untrue because Syria is a cradle of civilization and uh, Damascus is the oldest city in the world that goes back 10,000 plus years in history. And I believe that a lot has come out from that spot of the world. And even if, if things were not happening as ideally in the past 60, 70 years in my home country where corruption started, where there was a coup and the regime has just, and the, the, there was so much, uh, I think they, they, they hijacked the civilization. Uh, and, but people were, were asking for their freedoms and for the reforms. And I think at the end of the day, um, it does not really matter. And I really hope people are going always to, um, to fight for, for uh, equality in, in responses to these crises. Thank you so yeah. much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think Tarek said far more diplomatically <laughs> many of the points that I would say in a far more crass manner. So I think I will, uh, I will defer to his answer. Um, I, I, I don't know if I'm capable of doing anything else, honestly. Um, sometimes I, I feel bad because I want to, I want to give a sort of profound an, Answer and, and my brain is just saying racism. Right, the, the answer the answer is one word. It's racist. You know, um, on an individual level, I, I am. Anyone who is driven from their home, deserves shelter, and that's not just a moral position. That's a legal position. We have constructs and obligations post World War II that describe exactly what happens when somebody is forced from. The matter is not the 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 enforcement structure. The matter is will. And to be perfectly frank, it is quite often much easier to, to do right by those obligations when the person you're doing right by looks like you. Um, and that's, that's not a legal matter. Um, that's something else entirely. Um, but I never want to get into that position. I think Tarek expressed this quite eloquently, where I'm suddenly wishing ill on these people who are fleeing their homes. Mm -hmm because they happen to be subject to a better systemic treatment mm -hmm. because of the color of their skin or their background. Mm -hmm. Individually, nobody deserves this. Mm -hmm. Again, this comes back to an issue of fixing the system mm -hmm. such that we're not in a position where we're looking at this glaring disparity and trying to come up with ways of not talking about the fundamental racism at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. I <clears throat> don't me. imagine I'll ever be in DC uh, talking to important people like Tarek was just doing, uh, so I can speak bluntly. I, I think it's just like white supremacist, like historically entrenched white supremacist geopolitical propaganda. Uh, yeah, so brown refugees, black refugees, the largest refugee camp in Kenya, uh, full of brown and black people. <sighs> Who cares, you know? Um, but I do wish everyone well, and shelter and home and peace and safety. Um, I would be lying if I didn't say that it hurt. Uh, it didn't hurt, because it does. It hurts to see um, some people get a chance at literally surviving and having a life free of uh, imprisonment, um, and others not even thought of. Yeah, so that was this book really brought a lot of those feelings. So I apologize for being so blunt and emotional, but this book was just like, oh my God, because that first scene brought to mind um, a thing that happened in real life. I think a lot of us saw a child on the beach um, and that first scene just like brought me back to that. I was like, what kind of world is this? <laughs> Where like I get to, I don't know, go to the cinema and buy shoes and be free um, and other human beings just like this um, drown because nobody cares. Does anyone? Ah, thank you for that question. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? I apologize. They won't all be so intense. Like it won't. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> all looking at you. Oh, it's fine. He, I'm he happy started to in 2017. Now. His book, America <clears throat> was the first, I think. So let's um, go chronologically. So, so one of the things, like the pub publishers really love Canada Reads because the books that end up on Canada Reads sell a ton of copies. And most books don't sell a ton of copies. Most <laughs> books don't sell enough to live on. I mean, I'm, I'm doing better than most writers I know. I don't think I could live off of the royalties from, from this book. So when you get that bump, that's a huge deal. The other reason that I really like the idea of Canada Reads is because for one week a year, the public broadcaster dedicates time for some folks to talk about books, which is rare. It's not, it's not something I take for granted. Is there anything similar in the US? They tried once. They tried the like great American read off or whatever. Oh, nobody no. cared. Like no, <laughs> it's too big and it's too sprawling. And it's like, okay, we have you know, it, it's it, it's actually a, a much bigger version of the of the same problem you sometimes have on Canada Reads, right. which is like, hey, Canada's a big country, like you know, the U.S. is ten times bigger, and so you're like, okay, the greatest book in American history. We've got you know uh, Huckleberry Finn, and we've got Beloved. And our two <laughs> finalists, like, let's go, you know? Like, it's like, what, is, what, what, what America are you talking about? And so y you get a little bit of that, right? And, and that's, I think, why they're deliberately very vague in the, in the one book Canada, one book to connect us, one book. They can't be like, one book about indoor plumbing. And then there's a novel about indoor plumbing that just wins right away. You know, like, you can't do that. You have that's to right. pick something very broad. Um, my sense is that, you know, it would be, it might be a much more compelling show if they went really mean, like if they embraced their inner American and were just, this was just a free-for-all like brawl and people were yelling at each other. And then you'd have the, the kind of, you know, it would be reality TV and it would, be, yeah. it would be trashy, but people would watch sort of thing, which I don't think is what anybody at CBC Books wants to do, right? That's right, yeah. okay. um, I think they're still trying to figure out a way to make it such that, like there used to be shows on CBC where people just talked about books and there was no winning book at the end, right? Like you just talked about it. And I'm wondering if one day they're just gonna let go of like the winner of Canada Reads mm -hmm. and instead it's just this incredibly thoughtful conversation about the books. Mm -hmm. Again, I think some publishers would get pissed off because we need a winner because the winner is going to bump up to the bestseller list and so on and so forth. But I think if you wanted to have a deeper conversation about books, you could do worse than getting rid of the structure where these books that really should not be in competition with each other, no books should be in competition with each other. But like, if you just got rid of that, you could just have a conversation about books, but it wouldn't be as flashy, I suppose. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, I was on Canada Reads last year, and my book was a finalist um, alongside uh, Johnny Appleseed, which won. Um, and I was really committed to not watching it because it's it's like my I, I spent seven years writing this, you know, like I it's like my heart. I don't want to hear people pick it apart, but um, it was fun. My defender was so passionate. Roger is amazing, um, and. It was really, I mean, I'm trying to imagine, like I didn't expect, Canada's a big country. We're all so different, so different. Um, everyone is different, but just culturally, cultural tastes, like arts, what people consider interesting, is so, so wide, but for publicity is amazing because people who I never imagined would be interested in reading about like twins and Nigerian folklore, bought it and were like, oh, I actually really like this. I wouldn't have known. So I think if the, the point is to publicize new books or like books that like well-known Canadian celebrities like, that's awesome. Um, but there isn't a book to unite us all. <laughs> it's not a thing. There's many books that we can talk about, but like, I don't know. Um, and and um, it, it didn't get dirty <laughs> last year, but there were some right. comments yeah. that I was like, that is somebody, one critique of my book was that it's trauma porn. And I was like, excuse you. Of course I didn't say that because I wasn't there, but I was hers and I was like, that's not, that's not true at all. Why did you take such a cheap shot? But that's the point, you know? Anyway, that doesn't answer the question, does it? <laughs> um, I think for me, you know, I was, uh, I was first, uh, the real trauma after Candle Reads is the sound of the bell. <laughs> That sound of the bell, like we say in your head, it's like you have only 60 seconds that you have to express your idea. I think, um, first, the, the themes of the books are somehow exclude, like they are excluding really good books and good ideas. You know, one book to connect us. 
uh, Canada reads by the name of the show. You know, What Strange Paradise, it had nothing to do with Canada other than a mention of a maple syrup bottle in the shed. <laughs> yeah. That was the only Canadian thing in the book probably, right? So yeah. probably, and that was, that was so hard for me really to, to just bring it on a show like Canada Reads and I, with, with my blood, sweat and tears, I believe that this book is, is worth being there. But at the same time, you know, they tell you, well, five books, they are, be, they are gonna be there, they're gonna get exposure for, for some time, they're all winners, right? That's what they tell you. It's like they're, they're the five books are, are winners on the show anyway. And I believe in it and uh, in a way it is, um, it's great to have that show in, in, uh, in, in a way to uh, feature uh, literature and really encourage people to read. Uh, my sister in her high school, she was like, everyone was watching every single day and everyone read the five books. And probably she, she said that she read two books in three years. She does not have time. And she was like, okay, well, this competition really has encouraged me to go and read the five books. And she was like, well, I'm not biased, but your book really was the best one. I'm like, well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, the, uh, the overall, uh, the, I was happy with this, with this year's uh, discussion and, uh, specifically because it was not as the, uh, probably the 2017 when the, the finale was between forgiveness and American war. And it was, it, it was not right. I think there was, there was yelling. Yeah. People were not able even to listen to each other. The people were literally fighting. That's why they changed it from the battle of the books now. They're just calling it, you know, just That's champion. the lasting impact of my book on Canada Reads. They have to change the format around. <laughs> so we were like, let's change the narrative a little bit about, about the show. But um, the other thing about Canada Reads, which I hope um, it could be worked on and improved, is it's very hard to compare apple to oranges, like oranges. You know, it's, it's really, really difficult for us as panelists to be talking about the same theme, talking about love. And then something, you know, a book like uh, 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 Scarborough talks about inequality and injustice, you know, poverty. Five Little Indians talks about residential schools and survivors and all of that. And I'm like, I, how am I gonna compare refugees to, to these topics? Like, this is really difficult, right? I mean, it comes down to that idea of like, the, 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 the fundamental premise is that like, they shouldn't be in competition, they shouldn't be in competition with competition. each other. That's right, to, 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 because they're all really worthy of, of being there. So I, uh, yeah, I just wish that really the, the, the discussion would be, uh, would be around you know, books that have a little bit more in common, really to make sure that you, know, you can compare and you can make the contrast to that. And it's, it's sad that there's no public voting. It's sad that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a strategic voting within the five panels. I have no idea how that would go. Oh that my God, if there was public voting, that would have been a disaster. So Maybe in that's one what way. they should do. <laughs> Maybe the next one is like, like yeah. American Idols. I would, I would like, say that, that that's like, right. like, it's fun to talk about Canada Reads and all the ways that it like, could be better or like whatever. The folks at CBC Books work their asses off on this thing. And they, they put in so much, so and they effort, get yeah. so much grief. It's, they get so I've seen some of the stuff that they get like it's rigged and like you've done this and you've done that and every year they go back to it and they try again and it's same cycle continues so more power to those folks like I, I don't I don't incredible. envy them in the slightest how could it even be rigged I just can't fathom because it's five strangers that's right pick any book from any the book. last decade right. that yeah. you like yeah. and, and well, defend like, it you know, well they have to approve the books like you know they send you the list and we're like probably this book is going to fit in the mix or not but i did not decide like you know if they told me before and they never tell you what the books are they never tell you who the other panelists are or the other authors and truly really everything is selected so if i knew that i would be talking and going into the competition talking against five little indians i would have chosen Probably, you know, uh, uh, something else. Or other people, would, if they knew that I was defending what's strange paradise, probably they have chosen something else to talk about immigrants or refugees. Yeah, it turns into a weird chess game and stuff. And yeah, it's just which, like, yeah, which is really, yeah, which is really, uh, I think, uh, the, the idea of it. Probably this is part of the issue as well, just to see what the panelists are going to bring to it. Yeah. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, I was really happy with this year's uh, panelists. My, my co panelists were really awesome. And it's great that it did not turn into personal attacks. It was very you know? sweet. They, they put us six feet apart, not because of COVID, but because they don't want us to fight. I thought this year was like gentle and everyone was really like just kind and thought, I mean, last year as well, really. I, I, don't, I, I didn't see the bloodbath. But if they had started like attacking each other and throwing stuff, you would have watched, right? Like that would have been, that would have been, been something, yeah. television. <laughs> 
Thank you for that question about Canada Reads. Um, any, any other questions? So your, your question is about how... So the loss of sense of self because of the loss of home and belonging. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly a, a thread that runs through almost every piece of fiction I write. Um, you know, I, I, was, I go back to the story a lot of, of... I was in southernmost Louisiana once. I was doing a story on climate change, and I was talking to this gentleman who lives down there. And after we finished the interview, we were just chatting. And he asked me this question that I'm sure will be familiar to many immigrants. He asked me, where are you from? And the answer I gave was not sufficiently satisfactory because he said, no, no, where are you really from? And then we did that little song and dance where we moved backwards in time until finally we got to Egypt. And I said, you know, well, I was born in Egypt. And he nodded and he said, yeah, you know, I could hear the Egyptian in your accent. And I was like, no, man, you, you can't. Like, I've been working on this for, for a while. You, you can't. Um, but it's a reminder that you don't have a good answer to that question, right? And, and I think it's, it's jarring to me on a number of fronts, one of them being that all of the authors that I really, really admire had the opposite of my life experience in that they marinated in a place and they understood it down to the marrow. You know, when I think of someone like Naguib Mahfouz and how he writes about Egypt, that guy knew the place. Toni Morrison knew what the United States was and what it was pretending to be. And she knew it because she knew the place down to the bones, right? And I don't have that for anywhere. And so one of the first things that happens in both of my books is that I, I sort of, you know, as a result, I have very little respect for the nation state as some kind of sacred entity, right? And so I, in American War, you open it up and there's a map and I've drowned the eastern seaboard and I've given the southwest back to Mexico and I've done this and that. And here, you know, it's the island is, is based on Crete, but the flora and fauna is all invented, and I've made up all of this stuff. That's the mode that I write in because I have no other mode that I'm able to access. I wish I did, because all my favorite writers are the exact opposite. But that represents in, in the characters as well. These are people who are unanchored with all that comes with that. The, the one thing they all have in common is this notion that they can't point to a particular place or a particular culture or a particular set of stories and say, this is mine. I have ownership over this. And that sort of cascades into their lives in a number of ways. Yeah, fundamentally, probably at a character level, is what all my stories are about. Um, one of the issues that I have is because I'm writing, <clears throat> in this book especially, I'm writing about my people. Right? I'm writing about Arabs a lot of the time, or I'm writing about people who have a similar sort of background or experience in me. And you're cognizant of, you know, I, I call it sort of Atlas Syndrome. Like, this might be the only book Knopf publishes this year that has anything to do with my people's experience. Time to present the entirety of that experience in the book and get it all in there. And that's, that's it, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. And, and I try my best to not do that and to not give in to the temptation to have cartoonishly good characters to offset the representations of people who look like me that I've seen in this part of the world since I was a kid. I don't want cartoonishly good, and I don't want an attempt at every possible manifestation of the experience of any aspect of my identity. And so my characters are deeply flawed. I agree with almost nothing any of them have to say. Um, and I'm probably going to keep writing in that mode, because again, I don't know how to do anything else. <clears throat> I have so much to say, but I'll, I'll just talk to you later about that. <laughs> um, any questions? OK. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I, mean, I mean, we can't have an event without an audience, so thank you. Uh, thank you to the King's Co-op Bookstore. 
And thank you, both of you. I could, we could, I just want to keep talking. Um, I really appreciate your candor, your work, same. <laughs> your optimism and kindness. <laughs> um, and yeah, thank you for allowing me to ask you questions. It's an honor. Thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for doing this, man.